Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Evacuation efforts are underway in southern Ukraine, where floodwaters are rising after a dam on the Dnipro River was breached overnight in the Russian-occupied Ukrainian town of Nova Khakhovka. The breach has created an additional humanitarian disaster in an area that's seen heavy fighting since Russia's invasion. Ukraine's government says floodwaters are threatening 80 towns and villages, as well as the city of Kherson, home to 300,000 people. The breach could also limit drinking water water supplies across Kherson and Crimea. Ukrainian officials accuse Russia's military of deliberately sabotaging the dam, calling it an act of ecocide. Russian officials blamed Ukrainian artillery fire for the breach. The disaster has raised fears of a nuclear accident at Europe's largest nuclear power station, the Six Reactors Aparicha plant, which is upstream of the dam breach. The head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Grossi, said earlier today the plant relies on a reservoir formed by the dam for critical cooling systems at the nuclear plant. Absence of cooling water in the essential water systems for an extended period of time would cause fuel melt and inoperability of the emergency diesel generators. However, our current assessment is that there is no immediate risk to the safety of the plant. We are following this by the minute, as you can imagine. The dam breach came as Russia's military said it had repelled a major offensive by Ukrainian forces in the Russian-occupied Donetsk region. It's believed to be the start of a long-anticipated counteroffensive by Ukraine's army. We'll have more on the dam crisis in Ukraine later in the broadcast. In Haiti, at least 42 people have died. Dozens more have been injured. Over 13,000 people have been forced from their homes after a weekend of nonstop rain caused rivers to overtop their banks, triggering flash floods and landslides. Even before the flooding, the U.N. reported more than 5 million Haitians, or nearly half the population, were in need of humanitarian assistance. In eastern Canada, Firefighters have contained a massive wildfire that's driven thousands of people from their homes in Nova Scotia and triggered air quality alerts as far south as the U.S. state of Virginia. Another major fire in southwestern Nova Scotia continues to burn out of control. On Monday, the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration reported the past year saw one of the largest surges of carbon dioxide levels on record, bringing atmospheric levels of the heat-trapping gas to 400. 24 parts per million. That's 50 percent higher than levels at the start of the Industrial Revolution and the highest level of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere in over 4 million years. China's accused the United States of provocative and dangerous actions after U.S. and Chinese warships came into close contact in the Taiwan Strait. Video of Saturday's incident released by the Pentagon shows a Chinese warship coming within 150 yards of a U.S. destroyer. This comes just days after the Pentagon said a Chinese fighter jet cut across the path of a U.S. spy plane as it flew over the South China Sea. A Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson defended the maneuvers. I want to emphasize that the truth is the U.S. side stirred up troubles and made provocations first, while the Chinese side dealt with this in accordance with corresponding laws and regulations. China always respects the freedoms of navigation and overflight enjoyed by all countries under international law. Meanwhile, U.S. lawmakers have invited Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi to address a joint session of Congress later this month. The invitation came as U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin met with his Indian counterpart in New Delhi, pressing cooperation with India in the face of the growing military tensions between the United States and China. Today, the U.S.-India partnership is a cornerstone of a free and open Indo-Pacific. And our deepening bonds show how te technological innovation and growing military cooperation between two great powers can be a force for global good. 
In the Israeli-occupied West Bank, a two-year-old Palestinian toddler has died after Israeli soldiers shot him in the head last week, while he and his father sat in a car outside their home in Nabi Saleh. Israeli forces stormed the residential neighborhood and started firing indiscriminately, hitting Mohammed Tamimi and his father, who was also seriously wounded. Tamimi succumbed to his wounds Monday, four days after being put on life support. Relatives are demanding justice. This is his uncle. When he was born, he stayed 30 days in the incubator. But after he grew up a bit and started walking and started to be active, he stole our hearts. Muhammad is a social child with a strong, loving personality. He would approach anybody. He captured our hearts, and sadly, this broke our hearts. At least 27 children have been killed by Israeli soldiers this year, according to Defense for Children International Palestine. The group said in a statement, quote, unlawful killings of Palestinian children have become the norm as Israeli forces become increasingly empowered to use intentional lethal force in situations that are not justified. This is a war crime with no consequence, they said. In related news, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has vowed the United States will play an integral role in helping formalize diplomatic relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Blinken spoke Monday at a conference of the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, or AIPAC, where he told the crowd, Washington has a national security interest in brokering ties between the two countries. Blinken is scheduled to travel to Saudi Arabia later this week. In Georgia, Atlanta City Council has voted in favor of funding the Atlanta Public Safety Training Center, a massive police training facility known as Cop City. The City Council's 11 to 4 vote capped a marathon session that began early Monday afternoon and lasted until 5 30 this morning. Activists opposed to City Cop City packed the Atlanta City Hall and took turns denouncing the $67 million project during 14 hours of public comment. After headlines, we'll go to Atlanta for the latest. Missouri officials are moving forward with the execution of 42-year-old Michael Tissius today, despite pleas from human rights groups and even former jurors in his case to spare his life. The Supreme Court Monday denied a stay, while Republican Governor Mike Parson refused to grant Tissius clemency. He was convicted of killing two jail guards when he was 19 years old. Six jurors, including two alternates, recently came out in support of commuting Tissius' sentence to life in prison. He his clemency petition described the horrific violence and neglect he endured as a child, which had detrimental impacts on his neurological and mental health. In 2000, Tissius was sent to jail over a probation violation, where his cellmate convinced Tissius to help him escape, leading to the death of the two guards. Oklahoma officials have proved an application by the state's Catholic archdiocese to establish the first publicly funded religious charter school in the United States. Monday's 3 to 2 vote by the Oklahoma statewide virtual charter school board came over the objections of Oklahoma's Republican attorney general who said it clearly violates the state's constitution. Catholic Church officials in Oklahoma are hoping that any legal fight over the charter school will reach the U.S. Supreme Court, whose conservative 6-3 to three majority has recently overturned decades of precedent on the separation of church and state. Federal prosecutors probing former President Trump's mishandling of classified documents have issued a subpoena seeking information about Trump's overseas business dealings during his time in office. Special counsel Jack Smith is focused on the Trump Organization's real estate licensing and development deals in China, France, Kuwait, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Turkey and the United Arab Emirates since 2017. On Monday, the group Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington reported Trump made over $82 million from his businesses in Ireland and Scotland while serving as president. Meanwhile, NBC News reports prosecutors have convened a separate federal grand jury in Florida to hear evidence in Jack Smith's investigation into Trump's mishandling of documents. Author, civil rights activist and professor of philosophy Cornell West has announced he's running for president as a candidate with the People's Party. In a short video released Monday, West said his campaign will focus on ending poverty, mass incarceration, wars and ecological collapse, while guaranteeing housing, health care, education and living wages for all.
I have decided to run for truth and justice, which takes the form of running for president of the United States as a candidate for the People's Party. I enter in the quest for truth. I enter in the quest for justice. And the presidency is just one vehicle to pursue that truth and justice, what I've been trying to do all of my life. And in Brazil, President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva has unveiled a plan to end deforestation in the Amazon by 2030. Lula and Brazil's Environment Minister Marina Silva made the announcement Monday as part of their efforts to combat climate change. This is Lula speaking from the capital, Brasilia. O Brasil. Mainly because of the Amazon rainforest, Brazil is largely responsible for the world's climate balance. That is why stopping deforestation in the Amazon is also a way to reduce global warming. I know the size of the challenge of ending deforestation by 2030, but this is a challenge we are determined to achieve. Lula's remarks came as loved ones marked one year since the murder of the Brazilian indigenous researcher Bruno Pereira and British journalist Dom Phillips, who were shot dead in a remote area of the Brazilian Amazon last June while investigating threats to the rainforest and isolated indigenous tribes. Several suspects in the case remain jailed awaiting trial, including the alleged mastermind who's believed to be the leader of an illegal fishing criminal organization in the region. Dom Phillips' wife, Alessandra Sampao, said they've continued to receive threats. We have received death threats via letters and telephone. When is it going to stop? When is it going to stop? The death of Dom and Bruno was not enough? We are at a point where we can no longer ignore the issue of violence in the Amazon. It is very important that we become more vigilant. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined in Chicago by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world.